I think my my talk today is a is a little more simple because I'm dealing with a uh, a more specific issue in the uh, consideration of uh, carry malformations uh, and other neural tube defects and uh, progressive curvature uh, in children and adolescents and the need for surgery uh, in this group of patients. I'm from the University of California, San Diego. I'm the head of pediatric neurological surgery here um, and uh, really are, are the um, primary children's hospital uh, for San Diego County, uh, extending into um, Southern LA. So one of the issues, and especially in dealing with younger children, is that uh, with Chiari's, pediatric disease is very different than the disease you see in adolescents and adults. Uh, and things that we see commonly are the presence of a syrinx, uh, progression of a scoliosis, a headache, but uh, more so headache with exertion. And it's probably because that's an easier headache uh, to describe on the part of children. Uh, and pain, uh, usually in the back, sometimes in the neck. Um, I'm sorry. Sometimes sorry. we can sorry, see uh, a presence of um, pain and temperature abnormalities in the upper torso. Uh, loss of fine motor control, um, but all of the, the myriad of things that we'll see in patients as they get older um, are more difficult to elicit in children. Uh, and it's not that they aren't there. It, it's just that uh, uh, it can be difficult in trying to figure out the presence of these or absence of these. <clears throat> and, and they can be quite subtle. Uh, things like hypotonia, gross motor delay, swelling issues uh, can be very difficult in younger children. So I'm sure many speakers have talked about the surgical considerations and uh, we had just heard about that. Um, I think everybody has very good understanding of carry decompression, uh, removal of the posterior aspect of the skull. We tend to take our uh, resections uh, very laterally, uh, usually the condyle, uh, the question of whether you use a patch or not, uh, whether um, to coagulate the tonsils or not. Uh, and these are all the same questions that we also have in children. So the question I'm addressing is, does surgery for tethered cord, carry one for malsion and or syrinx, <clears throat> or carry two malformation with or without syrinx, one stabilized curve progression and scoliosis in children and adolescents, uh, and potentially minimize the need for surgical fusion in patients with scoliosis? Uh, as a starter, uh, I'm just gonna refresh some of the terms that I'm talking about, I'm not certain uh, which are familiar uh, or which may not be familiar. Um, but when I talk about initial surgery, I'm talking about the first neurosurgical intervention uh, for a patient with a Chiari malformation, uh, whether that's an intervention for the Chiari, for a syrinx, uh, or for a tethered cord. Um, our eventual outcome groups were essentially twofold. Uh, did they have a fusion for their scoliosis or did they not require fusion for their scoliosis? Uh, I uh, will occasionally mention the Risser scale, which is an indirect measure of skeletal maturity. The Cobb angle, which is a way that we actually assess the uh, curve for scoliosis. Uh, and then I'll also talk frequently about open versus closed neural tube defects, and I'll, I'll also get to that. So this is the Risser grade. The Risser grade, and let me modify this so it's easier to see. So the risk grade is basically um, in children, um, a determinant of the extent of fusion and extent of skeletal maturity uh, of the iliac crest. Uh, and so basically bony fusion occurs from laterally and heads medially towards the spine with 25% um, basically being a risk or one, 50% a risk or two, 75% a risk or three, and 100% risk or four. But, but the importance of this is this is an indication of skeletal maturity. Uh, this allows us to determine how mature the skeleton is uh, in a patient that we're following and in making the determination, do they need a fusion or not? Cobb angle is, is basically the determination of the angle that we're following. And it allows us to follow a baseline uh, 
uh, and see if there's progression, reversal, or not. And it's usually documenting what is considered to be the apex vertebrae, where the deformity is centered, uh, looking at the likely fusion sites, uh, both above and below, constructing lines that are perpendicular, and where they intersect, they form an angle. And this angle ends up being the same angle as this, uh, which in this case is 89 degrees. And so this is how we follow these patients, um, basically that have progressive scoliosis. Open neural tube defects is conceptually a little bit different. Um, about four weeks after conception, um, you're starting with all of this tissue, which is ectoderm that differentiates into what's called neuroectoderm. And this is important because the neuroectoderm uh, basically involutes uh, and ends up at about 28 days uh, becoming the neural tube uh, or the spinal cord. Um, the problem with open neural tube defects is that's an abnormality that occurs before 28 days. So you essentially remain at this point. And what this basically has is an absence of skin formation at the surface, absence of bone, absence of all these other structures with the presence of the neural placode, such as we see uh, in a child with a true myelomeningocele. Closed neural tube defects are those abnormalities that occur after 28 days, after the neural tube is formally closed. Um, I think everybody's familiar with syrinxes, uh, but syrinx both in carry one and carry two malformations uh, are frequently associated um, with curvature of the spine. Lipomatous malformations are basically fat that's left in and attached to neural structures, whether it be considered a fatty phylum which is fatty tissue that's at the end uh, of the cord where the cord ends, or uh, a much larger lipomatous malformation, uh, which literally extends to the surface um, and at the expense of the normal bony structures, the normal uh, uh, muscular structures, and even the dura, uh, which are all absent, uh, and essentially the fusion of this fat to the cord. And finally, what we call a diastem, and that's where the bony or cartilaginous elements are left um, as part of the developing spinal cord, and you truly get an absolute separation of the cord, whether it be from a bony strut uh, or a cartilaginous strut. And then with Chiari malformations, um, essentially Chiari 1, because it is a post um abnormality, is not associated with a number of the abnormalities you see in Chiari 2 malformations. Um, it's rare that we'll see hydrocephalus in carry one from malformations. It's much more common in carry two. Uh, abnormalities of the brainstem occur. We have what's called beaking of the tectal plate. Uh, you literally have all the midbrain structures that can be descended inferiorly. Uh, so carry two malformations are uh, a much more severe and difficult uh, problem that we have to deal with. Carry was actually initially described in 1891. Uh, with initially three categories. Uh, the prevalence of Chiari 2 malformations is about 0.44 in every 1,000 births. Uh, and due to mutations in the mother effer gene, uh, we see these problems. Uh, and as I said, Chiari 2 is a complex malformation uh, involving the hindbrain. Uh, it's associated with a defect in neural tube closure, uh, a manifestation of an abnormality occurring basically before uh, 28 days after conception. So the background for our approach uh, is the consideration that in progressive scoliosis, um, in the presence of tethered cord or syrinxes or Chiari 1 or Chiari 2 malformations, um, but the reason for the progression can be unique for each of these things. Uh, some people have postulated in Chiari 1 that the syrinx leads to kind of an internal expansion uh, of the central canal, which can result essentially in an asymmetry of signal um, to the muscular structure leading to asymmetry. Uh, a similar type of thought process has been proposed for tethered cord, where it's believed at the actual site of tethering, uh, there's not enough blood supply to the cord. Uh, in the same way, you can get an asymmetric signal, um, different signal to the paravertebral muscles, which can then result in a progressive scoliosis. One of the problems that surgery of open neural tube defects, which are myelomeningoceles, uh, very often results in tethering. Um, some studies state up to 70% at the syrinx site uh, or the repair site, 
And we see syrinxes in open neural tube defects uh, anywhere from 20 to 90 percent of the time. Our consideration is that both to uh, tethering and syrinx in a patient would place them at a greater risk of developing a spinal deformity. And these are one of the things we looked into. Um, but overall, there's really not a lot of literature that discusses patients with Chiari associated scoliosis, uh, the characteristics of the curvature, uh, what the predictive factors for progression of the deformity, um, the neurosurgical and or orthopedic management and what's gonna be the long-term outcome uh, for these children. So the majority of scoliosis is considered to be idiopathic. We don't know why it occurred. Um, there are specific curve patterns. So when we initially physically evaluate these children and get images, uh, there are certain curve patterns that basically uh, lead us in the direction of getting MRI scans to look for intraspinal pathology. Uh, and in these cases, we always need to rule out an organic cause. Organic, uh, in my scenario, being uh, CNS abnormalities. Um, and the thing that's important is that uh, CNS etiologies in idiopathic or what are considered to be idiopathic patients can really range from 4 to 58%, so it can be quite significant. We do know that tethered cord, syrinxes, and curare malformations influence the evolution of scoliosis. Um, we also know that it's often that the spinal deformity itself, the extent of curvature, really becomes evident before we see any neurologic symptoms in these patients. Uh, when we do see neurologic symptoms prior to curvature, uh, these tend to be more severe cases. Uh, so we do know that neurologic issues need to be addressed first, whether it be the syrinx, the chiari, or the tethered cord. Uh, so not only to treat the underlying neurological issue, but also to treat the spinal deformity and potentially prevent it from occurring. When you look overall at neural tube defects, and I've talked about open versus closed, Carry malformation, once again, occur after 28 days or neurulation or closed neural tube defects. Carry twos are open. Uh, interesting enough, though, both are associated with tethered cord and both can be associated with syrinxes. So our study design was a 10-year retrospective study of patients with open neural tube defects. Uh, once again, carry two malformations with or without syrinxes, uh, some with tethering uh, or closed neural tube defects. Um, which are QRA1 malformations with or without syrinxes uh, and tethered cord syndrome. And we wanted to examine the effect of initial nurse surgery uh, on the development of scoliosis and the eventual need for surgery. The surgical group were those patients that received fusion or progressed in needing fusion, which is a greater than 50 degree deformity. The non-surgical group were those who did not require fusion. Fifteen patients, um, eight of which were females, uh, had a mean age of 7.4 years, uh, ranging from 0.7 to 14 years at the time uh, of the study. Uh, Ten had a tethered cord, six were QRA2, four were QRA1, and 11 had a syrinx. Uh, of those, 47%, seven did not require fusion, eight or 53% did require fusion. Uh, mean follow-up was similar in the groups, 53 months um, uh, for the non-surgical group, 64 months for the surgical group, mean age for the study was exactly the same at 12 years. Uh, and these are uh, some of the specific results that we found to be interesting. If you look at the change in the Cobb angle or the angulation of the spine uh, for the different uh, neurologic disorders, and this being the time of surgery, um, you could really see differences in magnitude based upon the abnormality. These are patients with CARI-2 malformations. These really represent patients with CARI-1s or syrinxes. This was another patient with a CARI-2 malformation that had very aggressive curve progression during the course of the study. And if you look at more specific characteristics between the two groups, we found the things that were statistically significantly different were the presence of QRI2 as opposed to QRI1. Presence of syrinx in and of itself, not indicative uh, of the need for fusion. Um, Risser score, not indicative. Gender, not indicative. Age, uh, also not indicative. Uh, additionally, neurologic findings uh, prior uh, to the initial surgical intervention, such as urinary abnormalities, uh, and other changes 
uh, were both found to be significant. Uh, so this helped us um, get a sense of those factors we need to pay close attention to uh, in trying to determine which patients are gonna potentially require surgery. When we looked at the univariate analysis, and this is basically looking at the individuals and the population, the number of CRI2 malformations with or without syrinx in fusion groups was significantly different than CRI1 tethered cord or syrinxes alone. Uh, in addition, the CRI2 progression, which mu was much more significant uh, as compared to those other groups. Um, when you look at the curve itself, um, the patients that needed fusion had basically a much more significant curve prior to their initial neurosurgery. Uh, following that initial neurosurgery, that curve progressed much more aggressively uh, and absolutely from the time um, just prior to the neurosurgical intervention to the time just prior to the fusion was also um, very significant in the absolute amount of curvature, the number of degrees that change in these patients. When we combined variables and basically the significant variables being curvature, uh, specifically curve less than 30 degrees or having a QRI2 or not, really the most significant variable for no surgery was not having a QRI2 and having a small curve. When we isolated these, a curve in and of itself was always indicative of surgery when greater than 30 degrees. Uh, a Chiari in and of itself was always indicative of the need for surgery in the absence of a curve. And when you combine both in five patients, uh, we also saw an absolute need for fusion. When you look at the actual curvature in and of itself uh, and compare the two groups, you'll see a much more significant difference uh, when you look at the primary curve, and this is prior to the initial neurosurgical intervention. So prior to the untethering, the syrinx treatment, or the treatment of the carry malformation, the curvature is much more significant in those patients that required fusion. Uh, and the same can be said at the curve magnitude over time, uh, whether it be pre-neurosurgery, with this being the surgical group, post-neurosurgery, with this being the neurosurgical group, uh, or the evaluation just prior to or not to the need for fusion, uh, where we see a significant uh, acceleration in curvature. So the results were basically that the curvature in patients with CARI-2 uh, had a mean of 49%. CARI-1, 6%, which was similar to tethered cord alone. Following neurosurgical vention, none of our patients had improvement in scoliosis defined by greater than 10 degree decrease in their cob angles. Eight experienced stabilization of their scoliosis. Any change they had was less than 10 degrees. Six of eight patients, 75% did not require surgical fusion. Seven had progressive worsening defined by greater than 10 degrees increase. Uh, and of those, six required surgical fusion. In our non-surgical group, all three patients were risk of grade zero. In our surgical group, six of seven were risk of grade zero. We found bracing to be ineffective in these patients requiring surgery, uh, and especially in those with QRA2s who required fusion. So really, the presence or absence of skeletal maturity was really not predictive for the need for fusion in our group. With regard to the degree in progression, patients with curves greater than 35 degrees in the literature suggest those are patients that are going to need to have surgery uh, and this was specific to patients that had a release of a tethered cord. In our series, we found similar results, but we were looking at, a, at um, basically a lesser variable in less than 30 degrees. Three non-fusion patients with tethered cords and pre-neurosurgery cob angles of less than 30 degrees did not require fusion. Five of seven fusion patients had pre-neurosurgery cob angles of greater 30 degrees. So in our series, the uh, presence of a curvature of greater than 30 degrees was almost always indicative of the need for a fusion. Tethered cord and syrinx, are they predictive for fusion? The literature suggests that this is true, uh, and we found the same to be true. Uh, in our non-fusion group, one patient had both a syrinx and tethered cord uh, and a pre-neurosurgery cob angle of less than 30 degrees. In our surgical group, seven patients had tethered cords, six of seven with PRI2 malformations. One patient not requiring a fusion had a syrinx alone. 
So overall in discussion, when we look at the neural tube defects that are open, the KRI2 malformations, all six patients with open neural tube defects required surgical fusion. All six had a tethered cord, five had a syrinx also present. All six had the largest pre neurosurgery mean Cobb angles with an average of 46 degrees. KRI1 being 23 degrees and tethered cord being 21 degrees in the surgical group. All six had the greatest magnitude of curve compression compared to the closed neural tube defect, the patients with QRA1s, tethered cords, or syrinxes. The question is, is this due to a concomitant presence of syrinx and tethered cord, which we don't really know the answer to. Um, we didn't see um, an abnormal proportion of atypical curves. We didn't see double curves. Uh, we didn't see kyphosis with scoliosis. Uh, some of the things that have been reported for other groups of patients, we weren't seeing in the non-idiopathic group, uh, basically the uh, patients with a neurologic origin to their scoliosis. Uh, there was no difference between the timing of the neurosurgical invention, meaning uh, when we operate on patients for the Chiaris, for the tethered cords, for the syrinxes, uh, there was no difference um, in the timing of those initial surgeries, uh, whether it be an open neural tube defect, a carry one, or a tethered cord alone. So the key points in conclusion, we believe there's an association between PRI malformation 1, 2, tethered cord, syrinxes, and scoliosis. Uh, we believe that neurosurgical intervention may prevent curve progression irrespective of the neurologic conditions in children and adolescents with preoperative call angles less than 30 degrees if there is not an associated PRI2 malformation because the strength of curvature greater than 30 degrees in and of itself is indicative of need for fusion. The strength of a PRI2 mal in and of itself is indicative of the need for a fusion. The combination of the two um, just further perpetuates that need. Younger age and a greater curve magnitude also increase the risk of curve progression. Uh, this has changed the way that we manage these patients. And based upon the initial curve, the age of the patient at the time of surgery, um, and the diagnosis, whether it's an open neural tube defect such as a QRI2 or not, uh, really has changed the way that we follow those patients. We tend to scrutinize them much more closely, both with neurologic exams, exams of their spine, uh, and imaging studies to closely follow the progression to determine uh, will they in fact need uh, surgical intervention. Thank you.